Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third seminar of the 2021 Rock US Think Tank Seminar Series. And the title of today's seminar is American Public Opinion on the South Korea-US Relations in the Biden Administration. Uh, my name is Alec Chung. I'm a research director at the Jeju Peace Institute, the host organization of this seminar. Uh, and I'll be the moderator today. And this 2021 Rock US Think Tank seminar series is project funded by the Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. Yeah. And just before we begin, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be wearing my mask throughout the seminar because we need to follow the COVID-19 protocol because I'm not, not alone in this room. Yeah. But if you are already vaccinated or if you are in an isolated place, like in your apartment or in your office, then you'll be fine. You can just, you, you don't need to wear a mask. Yeah, thank you. But I'll try to speak as loudly as possible. So please excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so moving on. And as the title of the title of today's seminar implies, yes, we are going to discuss have discussions regarding American public opinion towards South Korea. During the last two seminars, we discussed how South Koreans think about United States or South Korea-US alliance and so on. But today we're gonna to change, the, change the perspective. We are, we're going to look at how Americans think about South Korea and so on. So whether Americans have favorable attitudes towards South Korea in general, what Americans think about South Korea-US alliance, uh, whether Americans think the alliance should be strengthened to cooperate against North Korea, or what Americans think about the US troops' presence in South Korea, whether the number of US troops should be reduced, maintained at the current level, or increased, etc. And we will also discuss whether Americans think trade with South Korea is beneficial to the US, what Americans think about the rock. South Korea US free trade agreement. And besides, we will also discuss what Americans think about North Korea, what should be the appropriate US foreign policy toward North Korea regarding issues such as denuclearization of North Korea or human rights issues in North Korea. And whether opinion differs depending on how knowledgeable Americans are about North Korea and so on. And well, although there's no consensus yet, yes, numerous academic literature reveal that public opinion wields a huge influence when government make foreign policy decisions, especially in democratic countries like the US. So for instance, we all know that the Nixon administration had to decide to pull the US troops out of Vietnam because, of, because the war was so unpopular in the US. So understanding what the public think, how public opinion shift is important because they can be a, uh, used as a sources to predict government's foreign policies. So regarding the topics, we have two distinguished presenters and two distinguished discussions today. Yeah. So first speaker is Senior Director Troy Stangaron of Korea Economic Institute. Yeah. And second speaker is Professor So jong Gun of Gyeonggi University. Yeah. And our first discussant is Dr. Kim min Jung of the Social, Social Omics Research Center at Yonsei University. Yeah. And our second discussant is Professor Cha Chae -so of Song Kyung Gun University. Yeah. So thank you everyone for participating in today's seminar. Yeah. And so this is how we are going to proceed. So, Two presenters will have maximum of 20 minutes each. So that will be 40 minutes in total. And then after that, two discussions will have 10 minutes each to comment on the, presenta on the presentations. So that will be 20 minutes in total. And then after the discussions comments, then we'll go back to the, our presenters and presenters will have five to 10 minutes to reply or add something if they miss during the presentations. And then if we, if we have some time left, we'll have an open discussion before we wrap up this seminar. So without further ado, let me introduce our first presenter of today, Senior Director Troy Stangaron. Yeah. 
The title of the presentation is American Attitudes Toward the U.S. Rock Alliance and North Korea Policy. Yeah. Yeah. Senior Director Stangaron, are you ready? Yeah. 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 You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, and I'm glad to be here, and good morning to everyone in South Korea, and good evening to anyone in the United States. Um, what I would like to do and uh, is sort of walk through some survey data that um, KAI, my organization, has collected in the United States in cooperation with YouGov. Uh, we've, last year, commissioned our first annual survey with YouGov, and this year did one uh, select just prior to uh, the summit between President Biden and President Moon. And what I'll be doing is drawing off of both of those surveys. In a couple cases, I'll be showing you data from uh, both surveys to sort of give you a little bit of difference on how things have changed. Um, I will be touching on a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. So look forward to the discussion to try and provide more insights. But what I'd like to do is go ahead and I'll share my screen now. So. <laughs> We surveyed Americans about their attitudes towards both the alliance in South Korea and North Korea. And in doing so in the annual survey, we also did an oversample of people who identify themselves as following the news to a greater extent or following specifically the news in Asia Pacific to try and take and hone in on people who are really paying attention to issues hopefully as well. And so if we take and look at how Americans view South Korea. This is from our initial annual survey. What you find is that South Korea is seen fairly favorably. Uh, about 66% of a national sample either have very positive or favorable views of South Korea. If you follow that into the international news segment, it rises to 82%. And those who follow Asia Pacific news, it rises to 88%. So in a general sense, South Korea is seen very favorably amongst Americans. Now, in our survey before the summit, uh, we saw this decline by about 5%. Um, I would note, and you'll see this in a couple of charts I have later on, that um, because we did also do some polling on some other countries uh, as well at the same time, that you do tend to see sort of this slight sh negative shift in this uh, survey from the last one. So I don't think this is necessarily anything that's specific to South Korea. Now, I do wanna though dig in a little bit deeper into some of the data. So while there is about 60% of Americans in both surveys who find, uh, we find have favorable opinions of South Korea, um, when you dig a bit deeper, what you find is, is that uh, men in the United States have about 73% have favorable opinions of South Korea but only about 51% uh, of women do. And if we break this down by ethnicity, um, there's very high favorability ratings amongst specifically Caucasian males for South Korea. But once you move into uh, other demographics, African-Americans, Hispanics, um, that falls below uh, 50%, both are in about the mid 40%. Um, if you look by gender, um, the lowest favorability rating for South Korea is actually amongst African-American females. Um, that's only at 24%. Now, there is a slight caveat to this in the case of, for example, um, African-American women. There's about 34% who are unsure about how they view South Korea. So they, in essence, don't have a specific perspective on South Korea. Uh, so there is sort of a lot of you know, water in the data, if you will, there. Uh, in terms of for improvement. But I think what this shows is, is that, you know, when we think about South Korea's perception in the United States, that um, we need to also start thinking about how we take and reach out to other demographics other than, uh, you know, men or specifically Caucasian men. The United States, uh, as we all know, is changing. It's becoming uh, more diverse uh, each year. And so this is going to be increasingly important going forward. And Specifically, one thing that I think will be interesting to see as we do this going forward is that um, there is sort of anecdotal evidence based on um, K-pop concerts and other things in the United States that uh, those under the age of 18 uh, very much enjoy uh, Korean culture. And so they may be favorably disposed to South Korea, uh, but you know, public survey opinion data tends to take, and ours does, focus only on those 18 and over. So has those under the age of 18 
um, start coming into the survey data pool, we might start seeing shifts in the demographic side of things. So that's something I think also to look towards in the years ahead. So we asked Americans whether they view, and this is from the annual survey last year, South Korea has a friend to the United States. Or more specifically, we asked amongst the list of countries, you know, do you view this country as a friend? Uh, about 49% of Americans view South Korea as friendly. Um, about 40% though have no opinion. And as you can see, there's only a very small percentage, about 10% who do not view South Korea as a friend of the United States. Um, South Korea tends to do fairly well. You know, the numbers are fairly close to Israel and the European Union. Uh, so I think, you know, this is a positive uh, sign. For the survey we did just before the summit earlier this year, we changed this slightly because we wanted to try and really focus in on who Americans felt were a critical partner for the United States, not just someone who was friendly towards the United States. Um, the number, once again, drops a little bit, but we also saw declines for, we see now the European Union actually falls below uh, South, or actually, excuse me, ties South Korea. Um, once again, there's also still very large groups of individuals who really don't have much perspective on this. Um, so. In a general sense, I think this shows that, you know, there's a positive view of South Korea as a partner for the United States, but, you know, there's also a lot of room for movement on these types of opinions in the U.S. Now, if we ask, is South Korea influential in the world? About 42% of Americans believe that South Korea is influential. Um, to an extent, it's not surprising that, you know, the United Kingdom, who has long been a prominent partner of the United States, um, the European Union or Russia or China would be uh, seen as more influential. But I do think it's telling that, you know, Australia, Mexico, who is a neighbor of the United States, and you would think a lot of Americans might just view as influential just due to proximity. All of these uh, countries were seen as less influential than South Korea. We also wanted to see, given the pandemic, how people viewed South Korea in terms of its response. Now, 54% of Americans believe South Korea has handled COVID well. Uh, as you can see, that's the fourth highest score. Um, if you look at those who follow international news though, uh, Korea rises to uh, number three with 70% of people believing that it has handled the pandemic well. Um, we are in the process of doing um, our annual survey for this year. It'll come out in about a month. Um, so this is one of the questions, given what we've seen in terms of vaccine access, how, um, you know, Japan, for example, during the Olympics, there was a lot of discussion about the challenges Japan was facing. You know, how will these numbers shift, you know, from last year to this year? And I'll also be looking for this data on a lot of different questions to bridge the alliance, specifically in light of what's happened um, in Afghanistan. Speaking of the alliance, um, six in 10 uh, South Koreans, or View or Americans, excuse me, uh, view the alliance as beneficial to the United States. Um, this rises um, once again as you move into groups who follow the news more closely. Um, but as you can see, there's actually a very small number that view uh, the alliance as not in benefit of the United States. And I think this is important. You know, keep in mind this specific survey point uh, came out towards the end of the Trump administration. We spent a lot of time sort of denigrating the alliance, talking about how South Korea. You know, did not pay its fair uh, share, um, that, um, you know, the U.S. should withdraw from the alliance. And, you know, this is one of the things to where actually Americans had a very different view from the president. So on, in terms of the troop presence, um, about half of Americans would like to see, um, or almost, you know, 60 percent of Americans would like to see it maintained as it is. Now, if we, though, look at this data, um, it again rises with the uh, knowledge that people have. But when you talk about the debate in the United States, um, and you'll sometimes see people argue that, uh, well, Americans actually want troops to be withdrawn. The one thing I'd point out is, is that the Chicago Council, for example, has asked this question in the past, um, and other survey organizations have as well. And it tends to be fairly consistent. Um, you know, always about 50% uh, on maintaining, you know, troops or keeping troops in South Korea, depending on the specific language of the question. 
And when you tend to see people argue that they would like to see troops withdrawn, it tends to be people who don't actually look at a survey question based on um, American specific views of South Korea, but the question tends to be something along the lines of, uh, should the U.S. bring troops back from around the world? So it's not a question about South Korea, it's a general question. And that's challenging because as we've seen with Afghanistan, despite the challenges with those draw, you know, a majority of Americans wanted to see U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. And so I think when we talk about this, we need to be sure that we're talking about U.S. views on the specific country involved because they do tend to be nuanced. So we also wanted to see um, how the U.S. public viewed trade with South Korea and the FTA specifically. And one of the things this actually surprised me, to be honest, um, if you had asked me before we did the survey how many Americans were aware that we had a free trade agreement with South Korea, I probably would have said less than 10%. Um, you know, free trade agreements outside of NAFTA don't tend to get a lot of press in the United States. Um, it's something that you know politicians may sort of like huff and puff about, but it's not necessarily something that's really um, a big issue in terms of debate over specific agreements. And even if you look at generic polling uh, in things like Pew on uh, free trade, despite President Trump's uh, antipathy towards trade, you saw um, basically that uh, most Americans and growing numbers of Americans during his time in office actually supported free trade. Um, so while the numbers may look low here in terms of awareness, I wouldn't necessarily take that as a bad thing because I think it's very unlikely that most Americans would just know about the specific agreement itself. In terms of trade with South Korea, as you can see, a strong majority of Americans, uh, both um, nationally representative and those who follow either national news or the Asia Pacific, believe that trade is beneficial to the United States with South Korea. And this is strong in both parties. So we also want to try and get a better feel for soft power of South Korea. And we often hear about the growing popularity of you know, Korean movies, Korean music uh, in the United States. But the one thing that we found is, is that while there is an intense following of uh, this, um, many Americans, and actually a vast majority, 74%, have not watched a Korean drama or listened to Korean music uh, over the past year. And um, you know, I think when we view this, though, we also need to keep in mind that the entertainment industry has changed significantly over the years. Um, you have many more uh, niche channels. Uh, you have many more outlets that have developed over the last two decades to take and uh, go out and engage in entertainment. And so I think, you know, regardless of, um, you know, how you view this, if there had been a new British invasion now, the numbers would probably still be lower too than one might expect. Um, so it's interesting to look at this, but I think we also need to keep it in the context of the different media environment that we live in today, as opposed to perhaps a decade or two ago. So now I'd like to turn to North Korea. And clearly Afghanistan is a major issue. Um, we did this uh, question uh, just before uh, the summit. Um, we did not include Afghanistan, uh, though I don't know that it would have changed things given where it was in the news at the time. But if you ask Americans, what are the critical foreign policy challenges for the United States? Um, interestingly, uh, North Korea slightly edges out uh, competition with China. Uh, COVID-19 clearly is the primary driving issue uh, for Americans internationally, uh, but North Korea actually is much higher. Now, if you look at what Americans ranked as number one, China does surpass it uh, 24 to 15%. But when you put in top three ranked choices, it starts to come out that North Korea actually is a very important foreign policy issue for Americans. Now, how do Americans view North Korea? So this came from our annual survey last year. And you know, it's not surprising, North Korea is viewed very unfavorably in the United States. This is a bipartisan issue. Um, one of the things that I think um, has been clear is despite the growing polarization in the United States, to a large extent, uh, not totally, uh, North Korea has remained a bipartisan rather than a partisan issue. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that policy has remained that way because um, while I didn't include this slide due to time constraints, um, if you look at how Americans viewed uh, the Trump administration's handling of North Korea, 
Um, basically, there was great division. And if you look to the numbers, it matched up exactly with people who voted for um, Hillary Clinton, who would disapprove, and people who voted for President Trump would approve. And so there was a lot of polarization when it came to how people viewed President Trump's policies. Um, we hope to have a better idea of how um, that polarization is developing or dissipating under President Biden when we get our annual survey out in about a month. So we also asked Americans, you know, what issues should the United States and South Korea cooperate on? And when you look at this specifically, uh, North Korea is the only issue that is over uh, 61%. Um, it's also fairly evenly split between Republicans and Democrats in support for that. Um, but as you can see, um, global human rights, technology, um, development of national trade rules are somewhat close to 50% of Americans. But the challenge, I think, in terms of cooperation on other issues um, from a U.S. public perspective is, is that um, on all of these issues, about 50% of Democrats support cooperation with South Korea. Uh, but there is no other issue um, that you can find a majority of Republicans actually support cooperation with South Korea on. And this is the survey result that we took uh, just before the uh, summit. So this is fairly recent data. Now, in terms of North Korea's nuclear weapons, um, it's clear and simple. Um, the American public believes that we need to work to have North Korea give up those capabilities, that it is not acceptable for them to continue to maintain these types of weapons. But we also decided in the recent summit to ask a question uh, more nuanced. Um, I think we all understand that realistically speaking, that even if we reach an understanding with North Korea tomorrow, um, one, those nuclear weapons aren't gonna go away right away. And that two, that agreement will probably be done in stages. And so the question, and we've seen this also in some of President Biden's team's discussion about perhaps reaching an initial or a partial agreement. Um, you know, we looked at on the whole, Americans believe it's very important to take and reach an agreement on North Korea to dismantle its nuclear weapons. But if you ask them, would they support a preliminary deal? You also see that about 54% uh, believe they should. And even a majority of Republicans would support a initial preliminary deal with North Korea. And you know, I think this will be an interesting data point going forward because the partisan nature in the United States, I think, would lead one to expect um, Republicans to oppose a partial deal with North Korea as something that's inadequate or something that gave North Korea too much. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if um, their constituents take and start switching their views, or if this is something where Republican members of Congress tend to be out of line with their own constituents. Um, so we also wanted to ask in our most recent survey, um, should the United States follow South Korea's lead on denuclearization? Now, this question is intentionally somewhat open to interpretation. Um, you know, I don't think that this necessarily means that uh, Americans support South Korea 100% being the lead negotiating partner. But I do think what this means is that there is strong support, both amongst Republicans and Democrats, to have a lot more input and to take a lot more guidance and to follow a lot more what South Korea thinks might be the best way to handle uh, discussions with North Korea. Um, there's also the practical aspect that, you know, North Korea is likely to take and want to primarily negotiate with the United States. But I think this does show that there is strong support in the United States for greater influence by South Korea on what that policy does look like. So um, actually, I guess I did put this in, uh, apologies, I thought I'd taken it out. Uh, but as you can see, um, there's sharp, a sharp division during the Trump administration over the handling of policy. And as I mentioned, this did largely tend to break down along partisan lines, specifically by whether you voted for President Trump or Hillary Clinton. Um, human rights. I think this is something that is somewhat misunderstood in the United States. Um, Americans strongly support pushing for improvements in human rights in North Korea. And this is, I think, is an important thing to keep in mind. It's strong public support. There is strong support amongst members of Congress for this. Um, I think if we take and get a nuclear deal and there is no component that improves human rights in North Korea, if this is simply a sanctions for weapons type of deal, 
Um, you're likely to see strong pushback on Capitol Hill and strong pushback by the American public. It's very important, I think, that we take and see progress on this issue. And as you can see, it's bipartisan. 85% of Republicans, 88% of Democrats think this is important. This is just where the American people are on this issue. Now, humanitarian assistance, um, we tend to see um, you know, support for that, uh, about 50%. Um, even Republicans uh, have about 50% support for humanitarian assistance. So this isn't something that should be an obstacle to cooperation with North Korea. But we also asked about COVID-19. And if you look at the data, um, the National Representative Survey, and this is from last fall, said that you know less than 50% of Americans supported um, COVID assistance. Now, that rose if people followed international news or Asia Pacific news. But what's interesting about this data is, is if you look by party identification, a majority of Democrats and Republicans actually support providing COVID-19 assistance to North Korea. It's independents, interestingly, in the United States who, for some reason, are against this. So I think if we get to a point where North Korea were to be willing to accept COVID-19 assistance, and given the fact that, um, you know, I saw this afternoon, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but that they've turned down some of the Chinese vaccines, um, you have questions of how will we vaccinate North Korea. Um, clearly, the border closures are stressing the population due to challenges in terms of getting adequate food in, uh, getting adequate medical assistance in, adequate tracking. There's a real need to help North Korea on this issue. And I do think that what the data says, and we have this question as well in our upcoming survey, um, that there is at least a majority of Americans who see that need and would support taking and providing that assistance to North Korea. And with that... Thank you, and I look forward to discussion later. Thank you very much, Senior Director Troy Stangaron. Yeah. And right away, let's welcome our second presenter, present Professor So jong of Gyeonggi University. Yeah. The title of the presentation is No Rally, No Symptom, Then What? Yeah. America's Public Opinion and U.S. Foreign Policy Toward Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Professor So, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you for yeah. having invited me to this interesting panel. And... Um, I believe that um, uh, Troy's uh, presentation has been uh, fas uh, fascinating. Uh, it has uh, raised a lot of uh, interesting points and uh, questions as well. And I believe that the, all the questions would go to Troy uh, during this panel because he's the only American in this panel too. Uh, so what I'm going to do for today's presentation is to take a step back uh, or aside to uh, better understand where the American public opinion stands and how the American public uh, opinion uh, changes, etc. So let me just share uh, my PowerPoint slide. So um, uh, as Dr. Chung has introduced my presentation's title, my title is No Rally, No Symptom, Then What? I think this title tells a lot about uh, what I'm thinking about public opinion in America uh, and its response to the Korean Peninsula. If that is not about rally, if that is not about symptom, then what can explain America's uh, public opinion standing uh, in terms of two Koreas, South Korea and North Korea? What can uh, be a determinative kind of explanation, motivation behind the American public opinion toward the Korean Peninsula. I hope that uh, this panel could provide some sort of question uh, to this big picture, uh, to, to answer to this big picture question. I'm, by the way, Tong Kun So, uh, a professor of the political science at Kyung University. So my presentation for today has uh, uh, two parts. First part is about uh, sort of giving you some big picture of American public opinion and U.S. foreign policy in general. And as Troy mentioned, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, question, $600 million question, is about like, is this about South Korea specific? Or is this about American public opinion in general? So we have to understand American public opinion in general and then we can move on to some specifics related to uh, South Korea. So otherwise, we might have some biased conclusion 
that all American public is thinking this way and that way, regardless of South Korea. So I think that's the whole point about uh, this panel. So uh, let me just bring up uh, three interesting points related to uh, academia concerning public opinion. In the study of American politics in the uh, early 1960s uh, and 70s when there was the behavioral revolution, the huge debate uh, occurred about the level of conceptualization among the American public. In other words, American public is well aware or American public is ignorant. So then, uh, so a temporary conclusion back then was that American voters are ignorant, particularly about foreign affairs. So it led to the, uh, the famous Alman Lipman consensus, which is that uh, American public is ignorant, American public is uh, non consistent, American public is volatile, so that the makers of American foreign policy should not base their decisions on public opinion. But uh, the Vietnam War debacle, Vietnam War syndrome happened. And then a lot of things have changed ever since the uh, Vietnam War. Now American public uh, have been known to became, become aware, uh, not necessarily of details, uh, but of directions. So as long as the American public is well aware of where American foreign policy stands and where American foreign policy should go, then uh, public opinion is an important element uh, for the making or remaking of American foreign policy. And the third interesting point uh, is related to the recent phenomenon. Uh, as John Geller in 1992, uh, in his seminal book uh, about public opinion in, in the United States, he mentioned that every opinion is a marriage of information and predisposition. So predisposition is the key. So it's not like, oh, this information is given to me so I can uh, 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 stick to, or I can change my opinion. No, that, that that's not the way American public is thinking about uh, political issues. The way they think about political issues is that who is giving them uh, the information cue. So in this sense, not necessarily the message per se, but also the messenger is the key. One example is, as Troy mentioned about trade uh, preferences, so when Trump uh, came into the office and Trump said that, oh, trade is bad, then GOP voters uh, have turned around to believe that, oh, trade is bad. It's fascinating. It's kind of up until 2015 when the uh, Republican Party gave the Obama administration uh, TPA, Trade Promotion Authorities. The uh, uh, grand old party was the, uh, wholeheartedly supportive of free trade having given uh, the Obama administration trade promotion authority uh, to make the uh, T, uh, TPP possible. But then Trump came in and American voters and GOP uh, has a little bit changed. I mean, that's controversial. We'll talk about that later. So three points keep uh, in mind. Uh, 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 take uh, two steps back. So th this is about kind of debates on public opinion in America too. And Galbatz, uh, 1991, has provided some useful perspectives. And this is kind of general understanding of what kinds of uh, people, what kinds of the public uh, uh, in America exist. So there are three different kinds. One is Pacific, the second is passionate, or the third is Protean. So this has a lot to do with very different pictures uh, we could be offered when it comes to public opinion in America and uh, its relationship to foreign policy. So Pacific is like, oh, traditional liberalism, the public is always opposed to war. So let me just read it through here. Thus, except for cases of quick victory, the American president is politically vulnerable to external military conflict. Or in contrast, there could be some rallies uh, uh, during the time of a uh, particular crisis. Or the third point is about the public opinion in America is, oh, they are volatile. They are shifting uh, overnight, so protean. So Pacific uh, public uh, in America, I think this uh, uh, is an interesting uh, picture because 
after the end of the Cold War, uh, American public's view about the America's leadership role in the global community. I thought about uh, I thought about this subject, and I my my own conclusion or my own assumption was that oh, American people are always supportive of the single leadership, America first, America as a sole uh, prime uh, leader in the global uh, politics. But uh, that was not the case according to Pew Research Center findings. Ever since the first year of the Clinton administration in 1993, up until uh, 2021, it's been very, very consistent. American public prefers shared leadership to single leadership. So shared responsibility like EU, like NATO, like East Asian allies. So American public has been very consistent in terms of their preferences for the shared leadership rather than single leadership. So it's an, it's an interesting finding to me. What about the second kind of American public, which is passionate? This is very uh, well-known uh, uh, finding. Uh, uh, ever since the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis in 1962, when the Kennedy administration uh, well handled the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the uh, midterm election in 1962 was a relative success uh, for President Kennedy and the Democratic Party. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the uh, sort of spike and then uh, uh, slowing down. So Operation Desert Storm in 1991, the first Gulf War, uh, the Bush 41, up and then a fade away. And the September 11 attacks, uh, almost 90% during the uh, Bush 43, and then fade away. So these are kind of the rallies uh, uh, point of view, we can, uh, if you will. So rally around the flag effect uh, has been very uh, sort of interesting uh, cases for explaining American public uh, and its characteristic. What about third characteristics of American public? Protean. So this is a, a kind of confusing, or this is a interesting, or this is intriguing. When you think about American public opinion on China, as Troy mentioned about favorability, unfavorability of South Korea among the American public, and this is the same uh, question. Uh, since 2005, uh, from the uh, Bush 43, Obama time and then Trump period. So American public opinions toward China has been re relatively uh, stable, if you will, like a 50%, sometimes uh, unfavorable, sometimes favorable, unfavorable. So it's been up and down, up and down until the moment when Donald Trump came into the Oval Office in 2017 and Trump through the uh, Twitter, through the Fox News, or Trump has uh, sort of uh, pouncing, Trump has uh, uh, bashing uh, China. And then the unfavorability of China has gone up dramatically, 60%, and now favorability is going down to only 26%. So who's leading whom? So America is, so it, this, this tells uh, uh, something very interesting about American public opinion. So who is giving the information? Who is leading the charge? And then American public uh, can be possibly responding uh, to the sort of partisan cues, partisan information about foreign affairs. What's more intriguing to me is a finding by uh, 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 Tegu Lee of UC Berkeley in his article uh, in uh, 2020, I guess. Uh, the question was, uh, do you, agree that the mainstream news media is fake news? That was a question. Uh, and the mainstream news media is uh, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the CNN, etc. And the Republican side of responses are very shocking. Strongly agree 57% and 31% agree. So totally is about 88% of Republican voters believe that the mainstream news media is fake news. It's an interesting point because in Korea, in South Korea, 
uh, the reporters are very often times citing the reports and news articles from the New York Times or CNN. So we South Koreans believe that, oh, this is how American public is about thinking about uh, foreign policy. But about 88 percentage of the Republican voters believe that uh, the New York Times is a fake news, so they don't read the New York Times at all. Then we are kind of absorbing the only half of the uh, country's opinion about foreign affairs in the United States. So this is a very intriguing finding as well. What about protein? Uh, so this, this is a, a very similar to uh, the question of who is giving uh, me this question. So do you approve or disapprove of how President Trump is handling the coronavirus pandemic? This question was uh, uh, given in April of uh, 2020, I guess. And then as we could expect, the Republicans are oh, truly supportive of the, the management of the Trump administration in terms of the corona pan pandemic, and Democrats is quite opposed. So the same situation, same event, same development, but the party and the views are kind of day and night difference. So uh, let me just go to the second part. American public opinion on the U.S.-Korea relations. So like I said on the outset, uh, I believe that not only the snapshot of understanding when it comes to American public opinion and the Korean Peninsula, uh, but also the deeper understanding of the changes and shifts, kind of comparisons of public opinion standing in terms of Korea uh, are critical. So let me just go back to a little bit of a history of American public opinion and uh, the Korean Peninsula. This is the famous article written by Aldrich et al. in 1989. I think the title of the paper is uh, Dancing Before the Blind, Dancing Wild Before the uh, Blind Audience. So this has to do with uh, the knowledge level of American public opinion and the electoral consequences or electoral strategies. And their table, figure one, uh, is providing a typology of elections and foreign policy issues. So two by two table, typical, and low salience, high salience, the importance level, and then small difference between the candidates and large difference, difference between the candidates. So when the foreign policy issue is very critical, has a high level of salience, and then two candidates show very starkly different approaches to solving that uh, pending foreign policy crisis, then large effects can be found in terms of foreign policy and presidential elections. And what's interesting here is 1952, when the Korean War uh, was in Quackmire during the Tr uh, Truman administration, when Eisenhower said that, oh, I shall go to Korea about a couple of weeks prior to the election day, then uh, the Korean War uh, was a huge impact on the outcome of 19, 1952 presidential election. This is uh, about 1952, October 17th, the New York Times article, Eisenhower and, and Stevenson. So the Adlai Stevenson, as a defender of the Trum, uh, Trump admi Truman administration, I'm keeping uh, referring to Trump, Truman administration says Korea policy helps avert a world conflict. So the then Korean War was very unpopular. So Democratic contender uh, Stevenson uh, had to defend the Trump uh, Truman administration's uh, uh, policy and its uh, usefulness. So the Eisenhower uh, was on the offensive and the Stevenson was on the defensive. And then when I go back to the cases of South Korea or Korea appearing as critical issues on the US presidential elections or American political scenes, I could not uh, sort of uh, think of any more than like uh, four or five instances. Like I said, in a, a minute ago, Dwight Eisenhower, I shall go to Korea, a famous statement just before the election. And then he actually came to uh, South Korea, as you all know. 
1976, when Jimmy Carter was running for the office, uh, he mentioned that, oh, he would uh, withdraw the troops from South Korea. It did not materialize, but as you, we all remember, uh, these two guys' relationship uh, were very much deteriorated. And then this is an interesting uh, case. Maybe not many people are aware of this instances, but in 1988 presidential elections, during the Democratic Party's pre uh, presidential primaries, uh, Dick Gephardt of Missouri uh, it circulated this political uh, campaign uh, TV commercials titled Hyundai. So uh, this uh, New York Times article was referring to the rise of uh, Dick Gephardt through the use of protectionism mood in the name of Hyundai, the uh, campaign commercial. So the question was like about um, uh, $10,000 Chrysler car uh, is going to be how much car in South Korea automobile market? There was a controversy like uh, 48,000 according to Gephardt, but the Korean embassy, uh, Yang Yung Gil said that, oh, it, it's, uh, it's sold in uh, $29,000. So it was very interesting kind of a development about how much uh, South Korean uh, consumers have to pay for the uh, Chrysler-made automobile in South Korea and vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, American consumers in the United States. And then, as we all know, uh, Trump came in, job-killing deal. The Troy's finding was interesting to me as well because uh, even though Donald Trump, during his nomination convention, attacked the chorus deal by calling it job killing deal, only about 25 something percentage of American public was aware, was aware of the existence of the free trade agreements between South Korea and the United States. Uh, let me quickly move on because of the time limit. So let me just go back to the details versus directions. Uh, this is an interesting New York Times article uh, finding at the height of North Korea nuclear crisis. In 2017, when Donald Trump was mentioning something like, my button is bigger than yours, or little rocket man, etc., etc., the New York Times has conduct conducted a, uh, a survey and asking where North Korea is. They're asking the respondents to pinpoint the location of North Korea. And this is the result. Very interesting result. But to be fair, if I'm asked the question about where is Jordan, I don't know. <laughs> so is it a fair question? I, I, I'm not sure. So this is about kind of referring to details. But what about directions? This is a huge interesting, hugely interesting. 2003 versus 2017, there is a difference between uh, 2003 results and 2017 results in terms of whether America support for military action against North Korea. Kind of partisan uh, divergence in the year of 2017 compared to like uh, 41, 54, 40, 59, and 35. So details versus directions uh, number two, like, oh, if somebody is aware of the location of North Korea, then uh, he or she is more likely to oppose military attacks on the Korean Peninsula. So details and directions uh, are sometimes very much connected. And I think this uh, is also a finding uh, in the cases of uh, Troy's presentation. And I think this has to do with uh, U.S. troops support uh, finding in Troy's presentation as well. This is also shocking to me. Like to, uh, 2019 Chicago Council surveys, I mean, as we know, Chicago Council surveys are normally like liberal internationalism kind of trend. It's not about Fox News findings. But in this cases of uh, question, using US troops to defend the South Korea. So the blue light line is opposed. So 61% is opposed. And 26, only 26% 26 is, uh, is supportive in 1990, right after the end of the Cold War. And until uh, 2016, 2017, it's opposed is a kind of a larger trend 
among the American public in terms of U.S. troops uh, to defend South Korea. And then uh, 2017, 2018, now uh, they're more favor uh, U.S. troops are defending South Korea. So what is telling um, this us about? Like, is that, so this picture is, I mean, is, is similar to uh, the cases of the favorability, unfavorability of China uh, to some extent. So is this uh, related to the question of like, oh, uh, U.S. troops uh, stationed in South Korea, that's fine. But sending further troops to defend South Korea is problematic. Is it, is it the way, I mean, we have to view this uh, uh, sort of interesting finding? And let me just uh, conclude a, a couple of, with a couple of slides in here. This is uh, from my own research. Uh, who is, because uh, you know, I'm studying American Congress, who is opposed, who is supportive of uh, chorus FTA voting? The, the, when you have the district where a, a college level education, uh, people are uh, more than you're more likely to support a free trade agreements with uh, South Korea. What about North Korea bill co-sponsorship? If you have a, a lot of uh, Korean population, then you're interested in co-sponsoring North Korea bills. Or if you are uh, religious conservatives, then you're more likely to be uh, joining uh, North Korea uh, bill co-sponsorship. But that's more about individual uh, characteristics of members of Congress. And table turned around, uh, also interesting finding uh, from the perspective of South Koreans. Pew Research Center said that the most have positive views of the United States. Who is number one? South Korea ranks the number one in here in terms of favorability, uh, unfavorability towards the United States. And even the leftist government, uh, leftist uh, people on the left and people on the right, the difference is very small in terms of favorability towards the United States. So the final uh, comments, uh, I think we could have more uh, discussions about the implications and ramifications of American public opinion on the Korean Peninsula. But let me conclude with just three uh, quick points. The Biden administration, as we all know, uh, they are going to uh, try to restore the alliance relationship. Uh, but like I said in the beginning, we have to look at a bigger picture, where South Korea is located in the big picture of US foreign policy uh, uh, postures. Uh, they have to deal with Iran, they have to deal with China, they have to deal with Russia. So South Korea case is not the only issue facing the United States. So I assume that like preemptive peace building uh, might be one alternative the Biden administration could uh, take on. What about US Congress? The, uh, what's interesting is progressives within the Democratic Party are more and more likely to uh, engage in the peace building on the North on, on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the other side of the aisle, uh, GOP has witnessed the Trump Kim uh, summit two times, uh, Singapore and Hanoi. And is there any legacy that uh, the GOP is kind of in, inheriting? Like GOP is now in a new position in terms of response to America's uh, foreign policy toward North Korea. And the final point is like, oh, Troy is a part of this foreign policy community. Uh, the media, bureaucracy, think tank, corporations, and lobbyists. The foreign policy community is generally kind of internationalist rather than retrenchment uh, or isolationist. So we have to kind of uh, uh, step up the public diplomacy efforts, uh, but much more smartly, much more strategically than before. Okay, uh, about four minutes past uh, the 20 minutes. Uh, so let me stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor So. Yeah, and now let's move on to discussions. So our first discussant is Dr. Kim Min Jong of the Social Omics Research Center at Yonsei University. Dr. Kim, are you ready? You have maximum of 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and good uh, evening, uh, Mr. Stengeren. Um, can you see the see the screen fine? 
Okay, let me start. So um, my name is Min Jung Kim. I'm a researcher at the Social Omics Research Center at Yonsei University. Um, first of all, thank you for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this seminar. Um, I learned a lot about the American public opinion on in general and also on the US-Korean relationship today. Um, I'll talk about Senior Director Stengeron's presentation. So overall, it was very helpful to see the most uh, sort of up-to-date American public opinion on the U.S.-Korean relationship. Uh, so I uh, wanted to thank you, Mr. Stangeron, for the thorough explanation uh, of the survey. And among the many uh, interesting findings of the survey, there were some results that seemed most interesting to me. So let me just briefly go over those uh, points. So. Um, uh, so the American public seems to have mostly favorable view of South Korea, um, but that share of uh, the, the favor of perception is decreasing, although it was a slight decrease, uh, I thought it was interesting. And um, also it seems that the more they know about South Korea, the more they like South Korea because you know the followers of international news and uh, Asian Pacific news um, tend to show more favorable uh, perception of South Korea. Um, and also uh, it was interesting to see that many Americans see, uh, perceive the North Korean nuclear problem as one of the most uh, sort of critical um, issue, foreign policy issues. And also there was general public support for human rights improvements and humanitarian assistance in North Korea. Um, I was wondering if there was more support in the U.S. than in South Korea recently. Um, and also, uh, I think you dropped this from uh, your presentation, but it was in the original PDF file I got. So there was huge partisan divide in the uh, approval of the current American government's handling of relations with North Korea. And I think that was uh, interesting. Um, so first of all, I, I wanted to ask one clarification question for you. So um, as I said earlier, you uh, dropped this slide from your presentation, but uh, there was only 9% of Democrats approve of the current administration's handling of relations with North Korea, while 66% of Republicans approve. So uh, I was wondering when exactly was the survey conducted? Uh, because it seems that the uh, phrase current administration um, probably meant the Trump administration for these uh, survey respondents. So I wanted to ask you when exactly uh, this survey was conducted. And uh, so, and there was all uh, a decrease in the share of Americans who had a very favorable or, or favorable view of South Korea from 66% in 2020 to 61% in 2021. And I understand that uh, this exact question was asked only twice in 2020 and 2021, but I was wondering if there has been sort of a steady decrease in the share of the favorable view of South Korea over for a longer period of time. And also you mentioned uh, the gender race gap um, of that favorable view of South Korea in your presentation. So I was wondering, um, you know, how about their views, the male and females uh, views of other foreign countries or other Asian countries? So, um, you know, if I rephrase it, are Caucasian males generally more favorable to other foreign countries or Asian countries than, um, you know, other races or females are? And what could be the possible reasons for such gap? Um, and I was wondering, is it because uh, other races um, that Caucasians and also females, maybe they do not know much about South Korea because you mentioned that the more you know about South Korea, uh, you know, or Asian Pacific general, uh, the more you are favorable um, of South Korea. So maybe there are less international and uh, Asia Pacific news followers uh, among these other races and females. I was wondering um, about that. 
and the second question I wanted to ask was um, that, you know, 61% of Americans have a very favorable or favorable view of South Korea. And you said uh, two thirds of Americans see trade with uh, South Korea as beneficial to the U.S. And also 62% of Americans see the military alliance with South Korea as beneficial to the U.S. And also you mentioned that they think North Korean issue as one of the most important important foreign policy issues, and they also support South Korea's lead in the talks with North Korea, but only 44% of Americans view South Korea as a critical partner to the U.S. So I was wondering why there is such gap between these numbers, um, and also does the gap mean that American public thinks the relationship with South Korea provides sort of unidirectional benefits to the U.S., but there are very few issues for these two countries to uh, sort of mutually cooperate on, except for the North Korean related issues. And uh, my third question was uh, about the uh, U.S. troop presence in South Korea. So you said 49% uh, of American public wants to maintain current troop presence in South Korea. Um, but, you know, would, considering the recent opposing trend towards sending U.S. troops to defend South Korea, as Professor Sao showed, uh, just showed us, um, do you think, it would, you know, this number uh, change after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and, you know, the tragedy and the chaos after that withdrawal? Um, uh, I wanted to um, hear what you think about this um, you know, uh, the effect of the uh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan um, on the uh, support for maintaining current troop presence in South Korea. Um, so these are the questions I had on Senior Director Stenger's presentation. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Yeah. And now moving on to our last discussion, Professor Cha, uh, are you ready to give us your comments? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's my honor to be here. Nice to meet you all. I'm Tessa Cha at Sungkyunkwan University. Uh, my academic interest lies in an intersection between U.S. foreign policy and IR theory. Uh, for today's discussion, I have a general comment and some specific questions to our presenters. Uh, my main concern in recent months, especially after the Biden administration started is whether we can find a paradigm shift in US, uh, in US foreign policy, especially a realist turn in American grand strategy. Uh, many pundits actually explain that Trump is a kind of anomaly. His doctrine is just a improvised hodgepodge we, need, we don't need to pay attention to. In that, in that context, as you know, uh, Biden has promised he would be totally different from Trump. So he said, America is back, so is liberal internationalism, the orthodox consensus on US grand strategy. However, surprisingly, we are now witnessing, I think, somewhat synchronization or convergence into the Trump doctrine in three ways. Uh, first of all, of all, on China, for example, Tony Blinken in his nomination hearing, he said, well, the Trump, mishandled the US-China relations, but he think that the basic Trump doctrine, uh, his tough, hawkish approach to China was right. So he, he will follow that line uh, too. And Kurt Campbell also said that the age of engagement is, is ending and we are now uh, confronting the age of hegemonic competition. So uh, on China uh, front, I think that Biden and Trump has not so much difference. And secondly, on uh, the so-called the slogan of foreign policy for the middle class or the slogan of buy America. I think that is the reflection of growing economic nationalism uh, in America. And on that point, I think, I, I think there is a huge convergence between the Biden administration and the Trump administration as well. And last but not least, I think we can see a kind of retrenchment tone 
in both administrations. And I think it is rela directly related to our topic, the Iraq US relations today. So for example, uh, as you know, after the fall of Kabul recently, Biden made a statement and surprise, surprise, he sounded like Trump very much. For example, he said, I will not, uh, quote, I will not repeat the mistakes we've made in the past, the mistake of staying and fighting indefinitely in a conflict that is not in the, in the national interest of the United States. So basically he is talking about America first and the retrenchment doctrine from the uh, Middle East. So in this vein, I'm wondering we can, if we can find some uh, realist turn or convergence between Trump and uh, Biden administration in today's topic on American public opinion on the South Korea-US relations. Can you find some indications or symptoms in this subject? Especially we need to note that uh, this realist turn reflects the sea change in the distribution of material capabilities in the world. Uh, in short, America is declining while China is rising. Uh, so we, we can say we are entering into the multipolar world. So I'd like to find out that kind of change in US public opinion as well. So this is my uh, general comment uh, in this Spain. I, I have some specific questions to, uh, to presenters. Uh, first to Mr. Uh, Director Stangron. Are uh, reading your presentation slides, I think the Rock US alliance just looks good. Uh, there is no problem. The bilateral relationship is very solid. Uh, say Americans like South Korea as a friend, as one of the critical partners, important state in the world, uh, especially young generation like Korean Wave, BTS, etc. So they have all you know very favorable, favorable view on South Korea. But my question is, where are Trumpists? All those 74 million people who voted for Trump last year. Actually, I cannot find their voice in, in this uh, survey data. We do remember what the Trump administration did to the, the bilateral relations. He had a very transactional and negative view on the alliance. So he basically said Coros FTA is a job killing uh, deal and the presence of USFK is useless. He, had, he did mention about the withdrawal of USFK and he demanded burden sharing very hard. And he even said what game, the, the joint drill is costly and provocative. So, and he also always said about the so-called gap between globalist bloc versus isolationist people. So he, uh, argue that he is the voice of those hidden or silenced people in, in, in both foreign policy and in domestic policy. So I'm wondering if we can find any retrenchment view found in polling data in, in survey. And so I'd like to ask more specific data based on partisanship. So partisan divergence, how GOP voters view the relation, view the bilateral relationship in general. And more specifically, I, didn't, I need to know a gap between the establishment in the GOP, in the Republican party and grassroots voters in say the Rust Belt, the Appalachian areas. So I'd like to know how so-called hillbilly voters are thinking of, uh, are thinking about the bilateral relations. We were surprised in 2016 because polls couldn't detect, uh, say, uh, the so-called shy Trumpists. So can you find some undercurrent hidden uh, voices about uh, the bilateral relations or the America's relations to the world in general? So I have some doubts that maybe in our survey uh, method, Liberal cosmopolitan America in the two coast areas are overrepresented, whereas the voice of illiberal Jacksonian America in the, in the Rust Belt, in the Appalachian, in the Hotland is silenced. So I, have, I still have some reservation on the survey method uh, in detecting those undercurrent voices in American society. 
Okay, moving on. Now I'd like to turn to uh, Professor So. Uh, I have two questions to Professor So Jung uh, Initially, I'd like to ask what the meaning of shared leadership role is in, in your fifth slide. In the 1990s or early 20th century, 21st century, this would mean a genuine multilateral or a global governance. But given the growing anti-China and anti-Russian opinion in US society, I wonder if Americans can really embrace kind of the condominium with the two countries. Will they allow China and Russia to share global leadership with the US? On the outlet discourse level, we can find an uh, opinion on, say, concert of global power, something like that. Uh, Hassan Kupchan, for example, Richard Hassan and Charles Kupchan uh, recently wrote an article in Foreign Affairs uh, on this idea of concept of global powers. And in that article, they admit that the unipolar movement is over, the multipolar world is a hard reality. So they argue that Americans should admit that the world is plural in terms of ideology or regime character. So they genuinely believe that we should share global leadership with China and Russia to uh, confront all those challenges in the 21st century. But I'm not sure if the average people, average American people uh, embedded in US exceptionalism will accept this kind of realist or amoral approach to the world order or global governance. Then maybe this opinion on shared leadership, uh, Professor So Jung Gun uh, presented, maybe that shared leadership among the American people, average people means a coalition of the West, not a real genuine global coalition or the free world coalition against China and Russia. And in that context, Biden repeatedly used the rhetorics like the inflection point in history or the battle between democracy and authoritarian regimes. Then in that sense, this uh, pervasive opinion on the shared, shared global leadership actually supports for the uh, new Cold War, not uh, the genuine uh, meaning of global concept of power. So I'd like to ask uh, your opinion on this meaning, the implication of the uh, American support for global leadership, shared leadership. And next on your 14th slide, American borders and, the, and foreign policy toward North Korea. Uh, what is interesting in this survey is that all the options in the survey all the options are punitive, except doing nothing category. I'm wondering why there is no option like a Trump style summit or a top down uh, diplomacy or any other give and take uh, negotiation between Pyongyang and Washington. Uh, of course, I think that these survey items do reflect a dominant uh, liberal internationalist approach to Pyongyang in, in, in Washington. Uh, in this slide, I'd like to note the rise of the so-called arms control school as a minority voice in the contemporary uh, US, foreign or US foreign policy circle. So basically the arms control approach, as you know, seeks to strike a realist bargain with North Korea, uh, fully recognizing the fact that Pyongyang succeeded in uh, developing nuclear weapons and they will not abandon its atomic stockpile. Uh, this newly formed faction, the arms control approach, aims for a more modest trade between the US and the DPRK as, a, as an interim intermediate uh, step. Uh, so they want to tacitly accept, uh, admit Pyongyang's status as a nuclear armed state. And instead, they'd like to focus on curbing nuclear development and avoiding use of exist existing weapons. So do you think that, Professor Seth, do you think that the US public can swallow, uh, accept this kind of a realist modus vivendi, right? Actually, that survey you showed is talking all, all, the, all the options of punitive uh, stance, how to punish this rogue state uh, developing the weapons of mass destruction. But as you know, how they had the stark reality is that North Korea has no intention of 
uh, abandoning their uh, nuclear stockpiles. Then how about the arms control approach? So that is the uh, that is my question to Professor Sun. That's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Cha. And now back to our presenters. So Senior Director Stangaran, would you give us your answers to our discussants' comments, please? Yeah, thank you. Be glad to. And uh, Dr. Kim, Dr. Cha, thank you for your questions and comments. And Dr. Sa, I very much enjoyed your presentation. I think you brought a lot of good points of like the challenges of trying to see how uh, international affairs impacts politics in the United States. It's something very difficult. Um, you know, I think when we look at, you know, when there's been real impacts on foreign policy, or sorry, excuse me, on presidential elections, it's actually much rarer. This is similar to most countries, you know, people are concerned about their domestic situation, jobs, healthcare, education, these types of things. And so I think we need to keep that in mind. And I appreciate you trying to help flush this discussion out that way. Um, to try and get to some of the specific questions that uh, Dr. Kim, you had and Dr. Cha. So, um, the annual survey was done last year at the end of August is when the survey was in the field. The uh, one for uh, before the summit, if I remember correctly, I believe it was um, basically about two weeks or so before the summit was when it was in the field because we tried to get it as close as possible. Uh, but so, you know, that kind of maybe late May, early June period. Um, in terms of... Um, the data and what might be some of the reason for the decline in favorability and also the question you had on the one uh, chart on why there was a sharp partisan division. So on most of the slides, and this will get to sort of, I think, uh, Dr. Cha's question as well. If we didn't take and put uh, what Republicans and Democrats thought on it, that was because in that case, essentially, they were fairly close in their views. Um, I'd have to go back and double check for every slide to make sure that was always the case, but we generally tried to highlight where there was a significant partisan difference. So when you think about like the overall view of South Korea, it's fairly similar. When you start getting into more nuanced type things, such as you know how the administration is handling uh, North Korea policy, that's where you start getting political divisions. Um, specifically on that, um, and the use of the word current administration, it does refer to the Trump administration because of the time this survey took place. Uh, we also specifically use that because we were trying to, as well as possible, get people's view of actual policy rather than view of an individual. And the concern was is that if we'd asked, do you approve of President Trump's policy, you automatically get approval by Republicans, you automatically get disapproval by Democrats. Now, Clearly, uh, you saw that anyways, but we were trying to uh, give people as much latitude, if you will, to say what they really thought rather than sort of signal their partisan affiliation. Um, why we might see decline in favorability. So we'll have the survey come out. Um, like I said, it's, uh, we're targeting October 5th for the next one. We're going to try to do another small one by the end of the year. So we'll have some additional data points for our own internal data. Uh, but I think when we look at when the survey was taking place last year, there had been a lot of positive coverage in the United States about South Korea and how it had been a model for taking and managing COVID-19. We could see that in the COVID-19 data to where, you know, South Korea was seen as having done the fourth best job of managing the crisis. Um, and if you look to more people who follow the news, that rose to the third best. So I think some of this and you know, this is one of the nuanced natures, especially for, I think, a country like South Korea, is that some of what you see in the polling data is going to be reflective of, has South Korea been in the news? Has it been in the news in a positive way or has it been in the news in a negative way? And that's going to sort of shape to a degree the extent of the snapshot of that time. And so I think what we're seeing is South Korea, when we did this in the uh, spring, you know, while the summer was coming up, it wasn't necessarily a news item until it happened. So South Korea wasn't really in the news at that time. And so I think you saw some of that if you would say uh, additional support from its prior positive coverage kind of, you know, fade away. Um, how is it? Um, so in terms of the breakdown and what I want to do in this, once again, I'll touch on some of uh, Dr. Charles. I went and I pulled up and I had taken this out originally just for the purpose of uh, our discussion to try and save a little time. But this, if you will, as I'll share my screen again, 
is the for the annual survey, and it's similar in the uh, more recent one, the breakdown by demographics. So Dr. Cha, your question about region, as you can see, uh, the Midwest gets 22% of the national sample. Um, the South, uh, which is perhaps the most pro-Trump region, gets 36%. The West is only 22%, the Northeast 20%. Um, so there's, you know, I think fairly decent balance there. Um, as an American, I might break it down into slightly more regions, but you know that's kind of the way it's broken down. If you look at education, 43% um, of the sample is uh, high school or less. Um, in terms of political affiliation, you can see 36% Democrat, 25% Republican, 27% Independent. My instinct is, and this is based off YouGov's own work in terms of where people self-identify, uh, but that the Republican side is probably light. So I would, you know, add that caveat. I think while there had been growing self-democratic identification because of reaction to President Trump, though we do see this through each administration has uh, that administration tends to sort of uh, stay in power a little longer. I do think the Republican side was probably maybe three to four percent, probably too low for where it probably really was in terms of self-identification. And now keep in mind, if you talk to some pollsters, they will tell you that there is no such thing as independent and that they're really, you either lean Democratic or you lean Republican. Um, but, uh, you know, this is in terms of where the American people classify themselves. But, you know, keep also that sort of caveat in mind. Um, so the gap between the question of whether uh, South Korea is a critical partner or benefit, I think this is where when you're asking sort of two different things. One, is something beneficial to the United States? You're likely to get a larger response than is South Korea a critical partner, because this is the question of then, like, will South Korean troops be, uh, you know, serving with U.S. troops in foreign conflicts? Will South Korea be supporting, uh, like, U.S. efforts against China or something else? And also, to the extent possible, you know, and this gets into a question which would be difficult to answer, you know, people are probably also viewing this in terms of, do you believe South Korea can assist the United States in these areas? Um, we do know, you know, on the military side, you know, outside of the United Kingdom, South Korea has perhaps uh, sent more troops to support U.S. military efforts abroad than any other country. Um, now, we haven't asked this question, but I'd be curious to know how many Americans realize that. My guess is, once again, that probably be a small number if we're being honest. Um, in terms of... Uh, the troop presence in Afghanistan. I'm actually really curious about this as well. Um, our survey is in the field right now. Um, they'll probably, I believe it ends in a few days and then they'll crunch the data and then we'll prepare it for release. So all of this data is being collected basically at the height of this crisis. So with that said, I wanna caveat it with similar to uh, Dr. Sa's comments about um, the rally around the flag effect. I think you're also going to see a, a you know reaction to the crisis effect, and so when we do a survey later in the year, I want to see, you know, how do those numbers that shifted down shift up, or do they stay down? Um, but we also included the question, or the survey, excuse me, a specific question about whether the situation in Afghanistan makes you, well, how it impacts in essence your support for U.S. Uh, security operations abroad. I forget off the top of my head the exact wording of the question. But I think um, this will be an interesting question, and I want to try and cross-reference it to some of the other questions. For example, if we see declines in uh, you know, support for U.S. troops in South Korea, um, do those individuals match up with the individuals who felt they were less willing to support U.S. Uh, engagement internationally? Um, to the last couple questions that Dr. Cha had, um, and I, I, I thought your presentation, some of the things you raised were interesting about um, is there a paradigm shift um, foreign policy for the middle class in Afghanistan? And I want to touch on those very briefly real quick. Um, I do think there is a shift. Um, I think if we're being honest, if you look at the Biden administration's policy, it's sort of a kinder, gentler version of many of the things that the Trump administration was doing. I don't know that they would want to phrase it that way. But if you look at while uh, they're trying to improve relations with allies, um, you know, we did withdraw from Afghanistan, which uh, you know President Trump had put in motion uh, and it supported. Though in this case, I would say this is the one area where I might 
diverge and say, if you look back at President Biden's own history, he actually probably was in favor of withdrawing troops before um, President Trump. So if you go back to larger historic records, so this is something he probably would have done one way or the other. So perhaps on the Afghanistan issue, look at it differently. But on China, I mean, they haven't removed the tariffs. They haven't really engaged China in a way to remove the tariffs. There's been some discussions about taking the 232 steel tariffs off of the European Union, um, but we haven't done that yet. I haven't seen discussion about removing the quota on South Korean steel, though I would like to think that if we do eventually remove the tariffs on the uh, European countries, that we would also do something similar with South Korea. So you have on a lot of these major foreign policy issues, a similar approach, you know, maintenance of, you know, pressure on China. Um, I actually think to an extent that uh, they probably don't feel that the public's in a place to where they could radically shift on these policies. And that's probably one reason why. Um, I think on the trade issues, meaning the 232 issues, they probably could because this is too inside baseball, as we would say in DC. Uh, foreign policy for the middle class. I mean, if we're being honest, and I think all policy people should know this, and I came from a lower middle class background, though now you know, I'd be seen as part of the foreign policy elite. At the end of the day, what Americans want is they want job opportunities. And if our policies are enabling that, and if they're enabling them to raise their children and to give their children better opportunities than they had, I think there's very little concern about what US policies abroad are. But if those things aren't happening, then they're going to start looking at what those policies abroad look like. And so foreign policy for the middle class, if we're being honest, a real policy is about building the United States up domestically. It has probably very little to do with the international side of things. Um, but so to your specific question, where are the Trump voters? I think they are in there. Um, you do see, as I mentioned, in a lot of cases, um, overlap between Republicans and Democrats on the broader issues. It's when you get to the more specific things that you start seeing divergent. But I do think, and I don't have the answer to um, this, is there an undercurrent? I think that's actually a very interesting and provocative question and something that I need to think about how we look into the data and if we can find that or if there's future questions we can ask. So I do think that's important. And then the last thing I'll say, and I've Apologies, I forget if Dr. Shaw, this was you or Dr. Kim who had raised this, but the question about views in other countries and whether, um, you know, perhaps Americans, uh, you know, aren't paying as much attention or something. I think it would be interesting to look and see um, what the views of Americans are in terms of uh, the international news side and the regular and the just the generic normal sample uh, for like Japan, another country that should be well known in Asia by most Americans and China. Uh, but I haven't actually looked at the data, you know, beyond South Korea itself. Um, thank you, and apologies uh, for sort of a long uh, answer there. Thank you very much, Senior Director Stengaron and Professor Sir. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot to say because Professor Cha asked you really critical, important questions. But could you make your answer very short, about like less than five minutes? I'm sorry, but <laughs> could you no, go no, ahead? No, yeah. No problem. As I mentioned, I mean, all, I thought yeah. that all, all the questions should go to Troy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but just uh, in five minutes, let me just, um, uh, uh, great comments and great um, uh, questions from Dr. Kim and Dr. Cha. And uh, a couple of just quick comments on uh, Troy's presentation, and then I'll uh, touch upon uh, Dr. Cha's question very briefly. Uh, just a couple of things for uh, uh, Troy. Because I mean, the, uh, I uh, largely agree with uh, Dr. Cha's point of view about where are the Trump voters and stuff like that? So, because I mean, to me, uh, at least, uh, this whole survey data results are pretty much like a pre-Trump. If this conduct was, if this survey was conducted in, in about like in 2014, 2015, I mean, the results could be uh, roughly the same or very similar. If that is the case, then we have to go back uh, and find some more kind of uh, nuanced uh, survey techniques uh, and then uh, the interpretation of the uh, findings uh, are always critical. So for example, uh, the partially dismantled the uh, North Korea nuclear capabilities question, a very high number of positive answers, right? But is it like partially or is it like dismantled? So how the respondents are addressing the question is always the important uh, topic here. So they love partially or they love dismantle. 
So that that is uh, my uh, a little bit of uh, two cents. And um, uh, for your next round of surveys, maybe next year, I hope that uh, there could be some kind of conditional questions. For example, uh, not only questioning whether you approve or support the human rights condition improvements in North Korea, what about the question like, oh, uh, the North Korea nuclear problem uh, solved first before the human rights uh, questions are addressed? Uh, do you agree or not agree? That kind of a conditionality question might be very useful for uh, the policymakers uh, later on. So just very quickly on Dr. Cha's uh, uh, point. My reading of the shared global leadership at the uh, Pew Research Center finding is not necessarily about active internationalism uh, kind of uh, mechanism of thought among the American public. Like, oh, so we exclude Russia, China, or instead we include the Great Britain and France and Germany and NATO. I don't think that is the case when the American respondents are uh, answering this question. So they're, they're, my view is like, this is a rather sort of uh, inactive or, pas uh, or passive non-interventionism mood that could be found among the American public right after the Cold War uh, was ended. So we are not necessarily uh, going to be the uh, uh, global police anymore. We're going to give some kind of burden uh, 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 sharing with some allies. I think that will be a kind of appropriate positions uh, to be taken by the uh, United States rather than we are kind of doing everything, big stick, uh, speak softly, <laughs> I mean, uh, PR's version. So that's my reading of the global uh, shared leadership and the global community. And the second question about the New York Times survey, and I totally agree, and then uh, I, uh, uh, with your uh, uh, points about why not uh, some, uh, some, uh, some uh, negotiations, some engagement uh, in the name of arms control or even containment idea. But uh, if you look at the timing of the survey, that was a 2017 July. It was about a year before, well, almost a year before the Singapore summit in 2018. So arms control ideas or containment ideas were not necessarily there uh, uh, when the New York Times was asking this question. I mean, that's my assumption. I'm not uh, the spokesperson for the New York Times, so I don't think I can give you the uh, definitive answers. But my kind of hunch is that in 2017, July, when the crisis was very high, the arms control or containment or negotiations were not necessarily on the table in terms of the uh, questionnaires and, and, and respondents. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. So, uh, well, if, if we had some time left, we were going to have some open discussion, but I don't think we're going to have time for that. So let's wrap up this seminar right now. Yeah. So today, through Senior Director Stangaran's presentation, we learned that in general, the majority of Americans have favorable attitudes towards South Korea. Oh, well, it depended slightly. It, it, the result was slightly different depending on which the question, but still, yeah. And the Americans think the U.S.-South Korea alliance should be strengthened because it is beneficial to the U.S. and to handle North Korea. And, and Professor So showed and told us a lot of interesting results, like um, like in, introduced theories, like who influences, like who determines U.S. US public opinion, or introduced brief history of U.S. presidential election and how South Korea was an important issue in some of those elections and so on, and showed some of some interesting results results from regression tables. Yeah, and, and we are yet yet to discover how much influence public opinion has uh, when government makes foreign policy decisions, but we do know that. So politicians cannot turn blind eye to public opinion. And what seems to be encouraging is that a lot of, or at least half of Americans are very, have very favorable attitude towards South Korea. So, so I think that's a good sign to South Korea-US relations. Yeah. yeah so, so this was the third of the six seminars scheduled for the 2021 Rock US Think Tank seminar series. And Thanks to our distinguished participants, we were able to have very constructive, like high quality discussions. And 
Yeah, regarding American public's opinion on rock US alliance and North Korea policy and so on. And, and I'll thank you all and good evening to senior director Stan Garon uh, in the US and have a good rest of the day, Professor Sir, Dr. Kim and Professor Cha. Yeah, thank you very much for participating today. Yeah, yeah. I thank you all. Thank you.